The history of the late Eastern Roman Empire is often told as a chronicle of long decline. The empire was doomed to fall in the 14th century. The collapse was inevitable after massacred. The variety of dates touted as the point of no return for Byzantium is like none other. The most famous book about Roman history is literally called The Decline and Fall, and it covers a period of 13 centuries. There is probably someone out there making an argument that the empire was doomed to fall once Romulus killed Remus. They are all correct, of course. No king rules forever and all that. But repeating these truisms doesn't really advance our understanding of history. As a certain fantasy character once said, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So instead of looking for another point in time when it was all over, I decided to examine the final few years of the Empire's existence and try to figure out what could have been done differently to prevent, or at least postpone, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. As a start of the observation period, I am going to pick a date that is probably very familiar to many of my viewers. It's November 11th, 1444, the day after the Battle of Varna. The reason for picking this date is twofold. The closer we get to 1453, the less freedom of action we have. Once the Turkish troops are assembled beneath the Theodosian walls, all of the pieces are pretty much set. I think that the conduct of the last Roman emperor during the siege itself was beyond criticism, so we're not changing anything there. On the other hand, the farther we go into the past, the more uncontrollable variables there are. The crusade for Varna makes for a good breaking point. Before it, the emperor's efforts were primarily focused on its success, and the campaign's ultimate failure set the stage for the empire's final confrontation with the Ottomans. Every decision made by the last two Roman emperors past that point can be judged by whether it made Constantinople safer or more susceptible to the Turkish attack. So we're going to do just that and try to devise a viable strategy that would increase the chances of the empire's survival past the year 1453. And no, luring the whole Ottoman army to an island and trapping them there with your boats isn't a viable strategy. Mehmed was much smarter than the EU-4 AI. We're also going to be staying away from wish fulfillment fantasies and try to be as realistic as we can. Don't expect this video to end with Constantine single-handedly defeating the Turkish army, restoring the empire to Trajan's borders and colonizing Mars in 50 years. We're only setting out to prevent, postpone, or conceivably weaken the Ottoman siege. Every event in the span of those eight and a half years that wasn't directly affected by the decisions of John and Constantine goes exactly as it went historically. Finally, we're not going to be contemplating any harebrained plots to assassinate Mehmed. Admittedly, this is a tactic that had bore some fruit for other Balkan powers in their struggle with the Ottomans, but it cannot serve as an element of a reliable strategy. First of all, we need to understand the situation in the late 1444, the state of the empire and the surrounding powers. To do this, let's briefly recount the events leading up to it. In 1425, Emperor Manuel II abdicated the throne and joined a monastery, leaving the empire to his eldest son John. During Manuel's reign, Constantinople faced two different sieges, but through clever use of diplomacy and a fair bit of luck, the city stood. During the second of these sieges, John was in charge of the city, while his father was seeking help from the west, so he already had experience running the imperial government. In 1425, things were looking quite bleak for Byzantium. John's direct domains consisted of the strip of the Black Sea coast from Varna to Constantinople, the city itself with its suburbs, and several islands in the Aegean. John also had a brother, Theodore, ruling the despotate of Moria as his subject. At the time of John's ascension, the despotate of Moria constituted roughly the eastern half of the Peloponnese. Its capital, Mistra, was one of the key urban centers in the empire's possessions. From 1425 to 1432, the despotate absorbed the neighboring principality of Achaea, which increased its prosperity and strategic security. The other important Byzantine population center, the city of Thessaloniki, was currently besieged by the Ottomans and recently given over to the Venetians in hopes that they would be able to defend it. Thessaloniki eventually fell to the Ottomans in 1430. John also had five brothers. The one everyone knows is Constantine, the fourth eldest. Constantine was by far the favorite of John's. It was to him that John delegated the reins of the empire when he went on his diplomatic missions. Soon after their father's death, 
Constantine had proven his merit as a military commander. In 1427, together with John, he repelled the invasion of Moria by the Latin despot of Epirus. In 1428, John appointed Constantine and their youngest brother Thomas to jointly rule the despotate with Theodore. Thomas inherited the remnants of the Principality of Achaea from his father-in-law and became the de facto ruler of the Western Peloponnese. Theodore was somewhat envious of the favor shown to his younger brothers by John. He was the second eldest, so he presumed himself to be the heir apparent to childless John. Things were eventually smoothed out between him and Constantine. To renounce his claim, Theodore was given the city of Salumbria, where he died in 1443. His only daughter, Helena, was married to the king of Cyprus. I've already mentioned Thomas and what he did, so there are only two brothers remaining. The third eldest was Andronicus. Andronicus suffered from a debilitating sickness since childhood. It was either leprosy or elephantiasis. While still around eight years old, he was appointed the governor of Thessaloniki. Due to his condition, he was unable to maintain the defense of the city during the Ottoman siege and offered the control of Thessaloniki to Venice. After initiating this very first of the long line of wars between the Ottomans and Venice, Andronicus retired to a monastery, where he died six years later. This leaves us with the second youngest brother, Demetrius. Demetrius was quite plainly a pain in the ass. By all accounts, he possessed just the worst possible combination of ambition and ineptitude. The Paleologos dynasty always had complicated family relationships, but the real bane of the imperial family were people like Demetrius. The younger sons of the ruling house were usually given apanages to govern, like the aforementioned despotate of Moria. In 1422, Demetrius was given the island of Lamnos, but he refused to go there and instead fled to the court of the king of Hungary, claiming that he was threatened by his brothers. He returned back to Constantinople five years later, but he never gave up his ambitions to one-up his siblings. John sought help from the Catholic West for the defense against the Ottomans. Demetrius wanted the Ottomans to install him as the emperor in John's place. This wasn't something unprecedented in Byzantine politics, but the fact that his relatives knew about his intentions and still kept him around is baffling to me. You're going to hear a lot more about Demetrius as we progress in our timeline. In late 1437, John left for Italy to discuss the possibility of the church union with the papacy. The Orthodox and the Catholics were historically on bad terms, especially after the Fourth Crusade. But the Ottoman threat could not be faced by the Eastern Romans alone. They needed help from the West, and it would be more likely to come if the churches of Constantinople and Rome were in communion. John was accompanied by the Patriarch, several important bishops, and surprisingly, Demetrius. Demetrius was staunchly opposed to the church union. We don't know whether it was a sincere distrust of the Latins, or just a desire to foil his brother's plan. Given how he didn't have any qualms about seeking refuge at Hungarian court, my money would be on the latter, but it was probably some combination of both. Nevertheless, John took Demetrius with him, because he decided it would be safer than leaving him to scheme in the capital. The council took until June 1439 to deliberate. Constantinople was relatively safe at the time, as Sultan Murad II was focused on his campaign in Bulgaria. In 1440, John returned to Constantinople with the act of union between the churches. What it essentially meant was the submission of the Orthodox Church to the authority of the Pope in exchange for military assistance. The popular reception in Constantinople was very skeptical. Most of the citizens weren't excited about having to change the way they worship on the account of the Roman Pontiff. The Unionist churches, including Hagia Sophia, were nearly empty, and there was a fair bit of unrest throughout the city. Demetrius tried to use this sentiment to his advantage, because of course he would. At that time, he was governing Mesembria, a city on a Black Sea coast in Thrace. Constantine wanted to swap domains with him. He'd get a seat closer to the capital, and Demetrius would become the new despot of Moria. But the seat in which Demetrius was interested was the imperial one in Constantinople. When Constantine's envoys arrived in Mesembria, Demetrius was already assembling an Ottoman-backed army to march on the capital. Eventually, this attempt was put down by John, and Demetrius had to apologize profusely. He and his co-conspirators were imprisoned, 
but managed to escape later. When we meet Demetrius next time, he would have already somehow whistled his way back into the governorship of Lemnos. While this was going on, Pope Eugene was fulfilling his end of the bargain and calling a crusade against the Turks. In late 1443, the crusade set out from Hungary, led by the King Ladislaus and his senior general John Huniadi. The fighting initially went well for the crusaders. On the news of their successes, Constantine launched his own attack from Peloponnese and subdued the Sultan's vassal, the Latin Duke of Athens. In the meantime, the Crusaders have gained a favorable peace treaty with the Ottomans, and some of them went home, including Duras Brankovic, the despot of Serbia. But the papal representatives were not interested in peace. Cardinal Cesarini invented a legalistic loophole to absolve King Ladislaus of his oath and urged him to resume fighting. This time, the luck didn't favor the Crusaders. The weakened coalition army was defeated and the king fell in battle. All of the earlier gains were reverted and the Ottomans were once again dominant in the Balkans. This is where Emperor John found himself at the end of the year 1444. For decades he campaigned for the assistance from the West. He even became a Catholic to secure it, alienating a good portion of his subjects. And all he got was this lousy crusade. Constantine was still advancing in Greece, but Murat's retaliation soon came in the form of 60,000 strong army, which devastated Moria and destroyed the Hexamillion, a big defensive wall across the isthmus of Corinth. To be fair, the crusade wasn't completely without benefit for the Eastern Romans. The Ottomans have won, but they still suffered heavy casualties and needed time to recover. Murad had clearly demonstrated that he didn't plan to annex more of the Byzantine territories, so the emperor at least had some breathing room. The question now was how to use this time. The historical timeline resulted in the capture of the empire's capital eight and a half years later, so let's see if there is something that could have been done differently to get a more favorable outcome. Before we start theorizing a way to prevent the Ottomans from taking Constantinople, we should mention an approach that would have been downright blasphemous to talk about if I released this video on the 29th of May. I'm calling this strategy Full Demetrius. The basic gist of going Full Demetrius is cutting all previously established diplomatic ties with the Catholic powers and playing a good vassal of the Sultan for the foreseeable future. This means renouncing the Act of Union and almost certainly having to appoint Demetrius rather than Constantine as the heir to the Empire. Would this have resulted in a guarantee of peace and autonomy? Who knows? Even with the competent emperor in charge, there is no making sure that the Ottomans won't gradually absorb the remnants of the empire. With someone like Demetrius, there is a solid chance that he'd provoke some riot, and the Sultan would demand to garrison the city under the pretext of keeping peace. And then the city is lost all the same, but now you don't even have a great story to tell. All in all, probably not the best strategy, but I had to mention it as a possibility. In the historical timeline, Emperor John decided against going full Demetrius and kept true to the Act of Union. I think this was the correct decision, because it kept a lot of diplomatic possibilities open. I also think that some later Greek sources exaggerate the effect that the Emperor's nominal Catholicism had on the city's morale. The problem with the primary sources is that they are written after the fall, and everyone on the Roman side is bitter and looking for someone to blame. Depending on their personal preferences, the authors blame either the supporters or the opponents of the church union. Those who blame the unionists just state that it was wrong to agree to the Pope's demands and that God had forsaken the Romans for that. Those who blame the opponents of the union are more specific. They accuse the anti-unionists of sabotaging the imperial alliances and collaborating with the Ottomans. The person whose reputation suffers the most is the Imperial Minister Lucas Notaros. He's always portrayed either as a very slimy character or as an outright traitor. A chronicler by the name of Dukas quotes him saying, I would rather see the Sultan's turban in the city than a Latin cap. Another history tells that Notaros hoarded the Imperial wealth for himself and tried to give it to Mehmed after the city was captured. Mehmed loved the treason but hated the traitor and ordered Nataras executed. These accounts shouldn't be taken at face value. 
Dukas has many other claims that I find very hard to believe. In his chronicle, the Ottoman army has 400,000 soldiers, and the Hungarian emissaries help the Turks to aim the cannon. For the events in Constantinople, I rely more on George Francis, who was actually present, and he doesn't accuse Lucas Notaras of anything treasonous. Notaras might have been skeptical of the Church Union like many other imperial subjects, but as an experienced diplomat, he likely understood its necessity. Rather than stir the riots in the city, he worked to calm down the anti-Unionist party. We can be relatively sure that he wasn't some anti-Catholic zealot, because he maintained personal connections in Rome, Genoa and Venice. During the siege of Constantinople, Nataras commanded the defense of the seawall, which stood until the final assault. His daughters escaped to Italy, while the rest of his family didn't receive any special treatment from the Sultan after the sack. This should be enough to say that any accusations of treachery against Lucas Notaras is just frivolous slander. Now that we've cleared the name of Lucas Notaras, let's discuss the actual traitor in the Byzantine midst. Demetrius Paleologos should have been dealt with preferably before the death of John. At the very least, he should have been kept under arrest. What ended up happening was that when John died in October 1448, Demetrius rushed to the capital to claim the throne once again. Thanks to the intervention of Thomas and their mother Helena, his pretension was thwarted and Constantine became the emperor. But it was a close call. Then, instead of executing Demetrius for fomenting a coup, Constantine had given him the despotate of Moria. The reason for this decision? According to George Francis, Demetrius apologized very sincerely. Admittedly, Constantine probably did so to appease the anti-Unionist party, who favored Demetrius. His rebellious brother had cultivated a considerable power base, using marriage ties to influential families. By this time, the opportunity to get rid of Demetrius quietly was gone. This was a big strategic blunder. Moria should have been an asset for the empire, but with Demetrius at the helm, it became a liability. Instead of fortifying the peninsula, Demetrius spent his time quarreling with Thomas and provoking a local rebellion. Demetrius and his shenanigans should have been the first issue on John's agenda in the last years of his reign. Some sources say that Demetrius escaped imprisonment after his first failed coup and was sheltered by the Genoese in Galata. In any case, he was clearly a threat to the stable succession and should have been dealt with accordingly. When John dies, Demetrius is a governor of Lemnos. How this was allowed to come to pass is beyond me. If John had been able to get Demetrius out of the picture without major pushback from the anti-Unionists, then upon his death, Constantine becomes the emperor without any problems, and Thomas receives the full ownership of the despotate of Moria. Thomas wasn't any kind of administrative or military genius, but he was loyal to his brothers. With all of Moria under his control, him and Constantine would be able to better coordinate the defense against the Ottomans. We'll get into more detail once we reach that point in the timeline. When Constantine became the emperor in 1449, he was unmarried. This was a diplomatic card that should have been played wisely. Constantine began searching for a marriage alliance in the first year of his reign. His first candidates were the princesses of Georgia and Trebizond. When Sultan Murad II died in 1451, Constantine offered to marry his Serbian widow, Mara Brankovic, but she refused. Eventually, he decided to marry the Georgian princess, but the siege of Constantinople got in the way of the wedding preparations. I consider this to be another missed opportunity for the following reason. Before becoming the emperor, Constantine was going to marry the daughter of the Doge of Venice, Francesca Foscari, but the betrothal was broken upon his ascension. The explanation that George Francis gives for this is that no one would have accepted a Venetian empress. My guess is that it was another concession to the anti-Unionists. This is supported by the fact that all three of his prospective brides were Orthodox rather than Catholic. All in all, the alliance with Georgia might have proven to be important in the future, but it did nothing to deter the Ottoman aggression. A marriage to a daughter of the Doge, however, would have secured an immediate and substantial strategic advantage. The mercantile city-states of Italy had the most to lose if the Ottomans were to take Constantinople. The Mediterranean trade was the lifeblood of their existence, and the Bosphorus was one of its key arteries. A weak Byzantium wouldn't interfere with their business, 
but a powerful Ottoman Empire was unlikely to be as generous. However, after being snubbed by Constantine, the Doge was reluctant to send help to the besieged city. Other Venetian notables eventually persuaded him to send reinforcements, but by the time those ships reached the islands of Chios, the city had already fallen. If the Venetian help was sent without delay, it could have provided the defenders with enough staying power to keep fighting until more reinforcements would arrive. So what possible reinforcements would that be? Byzantine sources like Francis are famously salty about the help from the West, especially from the papacy. We had received as much aid from Rome as had been sent to us by the Sultan of Cairo, writes Francis. This is a bit unfair towards the Pope. Eugene IV at least sent 200 Neapolitan archers, accompanying Cardinal Isidore of Kiev. He also petitioned the Catholic rulers to come to the aid of Constantinople, but all these pleas were a little too late. That's why I emphasized the importance of the Venetian alliance. Having at least one fully committed ally at the start of the siege would have allowed to prolong it until others could gather their strength. On a longer time span, those may have included Duke Philip of Burgundy and the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III. But let's just focus on those who were already engaged in direct diplomacy with Constantine. The marriage proposal to Mara Brankovic, which we mentioned earlier, was an attempt to secure the support of Serbia. This one sounds overly optimistic to me. After the failure of the crusade for Varna, Serbian despot Duras Brankovic was unwilling to participate in any anti-Ottoman actions. In 1448, he refused to join the coalition of John Hunyadi, which was eventually defeated in the Second Battle of Kosovo. Add this to the fact that his daughter Mara was very supportive of her stepson Sultan Mehmed, and you get a very low chance of any assistance from Serbia. The time Constantine had wasted trying to secure it would have been better spent elsewhere. The time indeed was of the essence, and Constantine might have severely misjudged how much of it he had to prepare for an eventual assault. He had a truce with the Ottomans from his ascension in 1449, which gave him a false sense of security. However, when Murad died in 1451 and was succeeded by his son Mehmed, this treaty might as well have been thrown out. Some sources say that Constantine provoked Mehmed. Allegedly, he did so by suggesting that he is going to release Orhan Celebi, a possible pretender to the Ottoman title. Orhan Celebi was a great-grandson of Sultan Bayezid I and the only male relative of Mehmed with a claim to the throne. He lived under house arrest in Constantinople, and the Ottomans paid a stipend to the empire to keep him under guard. Allegedly, Constantine sent a message to Mehmed in 1451, demanding this payment be increased, or else he might release Orhan and maybe even proclaim him a rival sultan. Supposedly, this was the cause of the hostilities that led to the Ottoman siege in 1453. I don't put much credence into this story. It sounds way too stupid for Constantine to provoke the Ottomans and Mehmed doesn't strike me as a guy who needed a pretext to go on conquering. The Byzantines had made a similar move in 1421, upon the death of Mehmed I. The pro-war party in Constantinople had convinced Manuel to withhold the recognition of Murad II and play a pretender Mustafa against him. Mustafa's rebellion was put down, and for the Romans this gamble led to the sieges of Thessaloniki in Constantinople, with the former eventually fallen to the Ottomans. The circumstances in 1421 were way more favorable for the rebellion than 30 years later, so I highly doubt that Constantine would have tried the same play. By the way, when the siege came, Orhan Celebi was put in command of 600 Turkish defectors who helped to defend the city. Regardless of whether there was a provocation or not, in 1451 the conflict was already brewing. In autumn that year, Rumors began circulating that Mehmed was planning to build a fortress on the Bosphorus. When the construction began in April next year, this should have been a clear sign of Mehmed's intentions. The fortress was being constructed in the Byzantine territory. Constantine's response was too cautious for the severity of the situation. Venetian and Genoese notaries were pushing for an attack to disrupt the construction, but the emperor had sent three delegations before taking any forceful action. The first two returned without a response from the Sultan, the third one was executed. By that time, it was too late to sally out. The construction was almost finished. The newly built castle was called Boas Kassen, the Straight Cutter. 
together with a similar fortress on the other side of the Bosphorus, constructed 50 years earlier. It gave the Ottomans full control of the communications between the Black Sea and the Aegean. The Venetians were the first to taste the power that the Ottomans now exercised over the Straits. As soon as the castle was completed, Mehmed announced that every passing ship must stop for examination. A Venetian captain, Antonio Rizzo, ignored this warning. His ship was destroyed by the cannons of the castle, the crew killed, and the captain himself was impaled on a stake. Considering this episode, Venice should have been way more eager to send assistance against the Ottomans. One of the possible reasons that they didn't was that broken betrothal. In the months before the siege, Constantine ramped up diplomatic outreach to the west. The King of Aragon requested the island of Lemnos in exchange for the naval assistance, and the Hungarian regent John Hunyadi asked for Salimbria or Mesembria to bring his army against the Ottomans. These terms were agreed upon, and the treaties may have turned out to be valuable, but the empire also needed an alliance that would serve as a linchpin of the Christian coalition. The final element in the Byzantine defense strategy should have been depriving the Ottomans of their decisive advantage in artillery. This revolves around the fate of the Hungarian engineer Orban. Orban wasn't the only engineer who was able to cast large caliber artillery at the time. In the early 1400s there were several artisans who showcased massive cannons. However, none of them were in the Ottoman Empire, so finding and hiring such an expert would have taken a lot of time for Mehmed. The Ottomans had access to artillery, which they successfully employed in the siege of Thessaloniki and in the destruction of the Hexamillion, but nothing of the caliber that Orban and his peers could bring to the table. The huge basilica gun is what Orban is best known for, but he also oversaw the production of the rest of the 70 cannons that the Ottomans brought to the Theodosian walls. Having a skilled artillery engineer in the field was crucial for the Ottoman offensive. The siege of Thessaloniki, supported by their old artillery, took the Ottomans eight years. The walls of Thessaloniki were thinner than even the outer wall of Constantinople. Without the unique expertise brought by Orban, the Ottomans would have to rely on the artillery of the same caliber during their attack on the Byzantine capital, which would have greatly reduced their ability to breach the walls. The effectiveness of the Basilica cannon is up to debate, but the Ottoman artillery force as a whole had proven invaluable for the success of the siege. At the same time, the defenders were ill-prepared for an artillery shootout. They had some artillery pieces, but those were starved for gunpowder. In addition, the platforms of the Theodosian walls were too narrow to accommodate the recoil of the guns. The vibrations of the fire and cannons did more damage to the walls than the cannons themselves did to the Ottoman forces. Laonikos Halkokondilas wrote that in 1452, Orban was in the employ of the Byzantine Emperor. If that is true, his presence in Constantinople should have been another opportunity to affect the power balance in the upcoming confrontation. In hindsight, it is easy to see that artillery played a critical role in the siege. According to Halkokondilas, Orban left because he wasn't receiving his stipend due to Constantine's financial issues. He then left for the Ottoman court, where his arrival was seen as divine providence. In another version, Orban comes to Constantine with an offer to build him a huge cannon, and only after being turned down, ventures to give the same offer to Mehmed. This one is probably apocryphal. It doesn't make much sense for Orban to come to an almost bankrupt Constantine with such an extravagant proposal. In any case, it should have been imperative for Constantine to not let Orban go to Mehmed. I may be using the Venetians a bit too much in my strategizing, but I bet they were interested in some cannons and had enough money to pay for Urban's services. If all other ways to keep him out of Adrianople fail, then who knows, maybe he just slips on a banana peel and breaks his neck on the way to Sultan's court. Even if Urban didn't reach his capital, Mehmed would have still brought a lot of artillery to Constantinople. But without the Hungarians' expertise, he'd have a much harder time making breaches in the Theodosian walls. The damage on the fortification would be diminished alleviating a lot of pressure on the defenders. Ultimately, it would have served Constantine's plan, buying time until the reinforcements could arrive. In the historical timeline, the siege began on April 6, 1453. Mehmed had brought over 100,000 men, together with 70 pieces of artillery. By sea, they were supported by a large fleet of galleys, over 100 vessels strong. 
In preparation for the siege, Mehmed also sent his governor to Rohan Bey to Moria to prevent Demetrius and Thomas from sending any help to Constantine. Demetrius' brother-in-law had even won a victory over one of Turohan's lieutenants, but it mattered little in the grand scheme of things. The population of the peninsula was divided and irritated over the despot's mismanagement. It couldn't be mobilized for an effective campaign against the Turks. No help would be coming from Mistra to Constantinople. The defenders of the Roman capital numbered somewhere below 10,000 in total. This number included both the citizens put under arms and the small professional contingents sent by foreign powers. The foreign aid to Constantinople consisted of the Genoese mercenary company of Giovanni Giustiniani, 200 Neapolitan archers of Cardinal Isidore, several Venetian vessels which happened to be in the harbor at the start of the siege, and the retinue of the Catalan consul, Joan de la Via. During the siege, three more Venetian ships arrived from Crete. This ragtag band had withstood 53 days of bombardment and sporadic assaults. Constantine, Justiniani and other defenders fought valiantly, but the numbers were overwhelming. Considering the advantage that the Ottomans had in the troop quantity and firepower, it is a miracle that the city held for even that long. After the siege was concluded, Thomas and Demetrius remained in the divided possession of Moria for seven more years. Demetrius was comfortable as an Ottoman vassal, while Thomas held out hope that the papacy would send help. In 1460, after some missed tribute payments, the Sultan decided to assume direct control of the peninsula. Thomas kept on fighting in Achaea and eventually escaped to the Venetian territory, while Demetrius surrendered to the Sultan after some token resistance. Salmenico Castle and its commander, Constantine Graitzas Polialogos, were the last to hold out against the Ottoman forces. When its garrison surrendered in 1461, all that remained of the despotate was the tiny piece of land on the Mani Peninsula. Now let's summarize the actions that we have proposed. The main idea of the strategy is making an attack on Constantinople more trouble than it would be worth. First of all, get rid of Demetrius and appoint Thomas the sole despot of Moria. This would have allowed for better communication and coordination between the Paleologui domains, which would come in handy when the confrontation with Mehmed begins. This also removes the issue of the messy succession when John dies, and it weakens the anti-Unionist party. Secondly, when Constantine becomes the emperor, he should just go ahead and marry the daughter of the Doge. Venetians were the natural allies against the Ottomans, who should have remained firmly committed to keeping Constantinople out of the Sultan's hands. Nothing justifies putting this alliance in jeopardy. When it comes to other alliances, less effort should have been spent appeasing the Pope and more bringing in the powers with more pragmatic interests. Serbia probably wasn't going to help much, considering its own vulnerable position. But Hungary might have offered more substantial assistance. We've mentioned an agreement with John Hunyadi in exchange for land concessions, and an embassy from Hungary had reportedly reached the Sultan's camp and threatened war if he didn't lift the siege. Hungary was the only power in the region capable of an open land confrontation with the Ottomans at that point. If anything could have been done to motivate a more swift and decisive response from the Hungarians, it should have been one of the top priorities. A closer alliance with Venice would have enabled a more forceful answer to the Sultan's provocative fortress building. Preventing that construction would have kept open the communication with the Italian trading posts in the Black Sea, as well as Georgia and Trebizond. Also, as soon as Mehmed reveals his intentions, Thomas Paleologos could have started fortifying Moria. Restoring the Hexamillion would have meant that the Sultan either sends some of his artillery south or leaves Moria undisturbed, in which case Thomas would be free to send reinforcements to Constantinople. In both cases, the power balance shifts to the Byzantine advantage. Finally, keeping Orban out of Mehmed's camp would have further eroded the Ottoman artillery superiority. When Mehmed set out to Constantinople in 1453, he correctly estimated his ability to take the city without dragging out the siege into hundreds of days. Without a partial sea blockade and an overwhelming artillery force, he would have been reluctant to make this call, and even if he went for it under those circumstances, the siege would have taken way longer, at which point more reinforcements would have arrived. 
Mehmed was looking for a swift and decisive attack, not for a Siege of Kandia type situation, when the defense of Constantinople would become a go-to destination for every European adventurer hungry for some glory. The Ottomans still had targets for conquest in Anatolia, so the Roman capital could be kept in the long-term plans for the time being. And then Constantine expanded the empire to Britain, Iberia and the Persian Gulf, invented steam engine, nuclear reactor and the internet, and they all lived happily ever after on their space colonies, extorting tribute from the aliens like in the good old days. But probably not. Preventing or repelling the siege of Constantinople in 1453 would not have automatically skyrocketed the Eastern Romans into preeminence. Catholic powers were not lining up to be used by the emperor as a hammer for bashing the Turks. Their assistance came at a price. Generally, that price would be trading ports and islands in the Aegean. If the King of Aragon eventually shows up to the siege, expect a quarrel between him and Justiniani, both of whom were promised Lemnos. If Mehmed suffered a defeat beneath the walls of Constantinople, the Byzantines wouldn't be enjoying much of the possible territorial concessions. Thessaloniki would have to be returned to Venice to maintain that alliance, so the best that Constantine could hope for would be the Principality of Athens and that land in Thessaly that he'd been able to liberate briefly in 1444. Even something as fortuitous as civil war in the Ottoman Empire, after a sudden death of Mehmed II, wouldn't have resulted in immediate Eastern Roman revival. The impoverished empire wasn't in a good position to take advantage of a situation like that. Most of the spoils of a potential collapse of the Ottoman power in the Balkans were primed to be taken by the Italian mercantile states, as well as Serbia and Hungary. In these circumstances, just being left alone for a couple of decades doesn't sound like a bad deal for the empire. I think the key to the revival of the Byzantine fortunes in this timeline would have been the despotate of Moria. A lot of refugees from the ex-Byzantine areas were already preferring to move there instead of Constantinople. The despotate's capital of Mistra was becoming a new center of Eastern Roman culture and education. It was also an inherently defensible location. With adequate governorship, it could have been a backup power base for the Byzantine emperors, similar to Nicaea and Thessaloniki during the Latin occupation. Other than that, a key to the Byzantine survival would have been to navigate the balance of power around them. If any one power becomes dominant in the region, then it would automatically start eyeing the city of Constantine. Being more trouble to take than to tolerate is the name of the game in this situation. Money would have to be found to adapt the Theodosian walls to the realities of the new era of siege warfare. Whichever power comes knocking on them next, they are sure to bring some big guns with them. In the end, no one knows how history would have turned out if any of the key decisions were changed. But I think the picture I've painted is more or less realistic. If you'd like to add something to it or ask me a question, feel free to do so in the comments. We also have a Discord which you can join if you want to discuss these kinds of topics with me and other interested people. Thanks a lot for watching to the end of this unusually long video, and I will see you in the next one.